Today's date is August the 16th, 1996. We are conducting an interview with Melissa Conn. This is tape number three. So we'll just go back to um, briefly to when you found out the war broke out, if you could describe what happened or at that time. Right. Just before the war, Poland took over a part of Czechoslovakia. And feeling very patriotic, my father went over to the called Zaolzia to see the country taken over by us. The war broke out and I was only with my mother in Skesh. It was a little panic and everybody was leaving the town. We joined a group of people. I don't remember with, if we walk or we, we had any transport. I don't remember which one. We came to uh, Dombrovki, where, as it happens, <coughs> my school girlfriends father was a land holder. He sent already away his wife and two daughters, but... Was he, he Jewish? No. He knew me because sometimes I came with his daughter uh, to his tables perhaps. And he told me, Marisha, stay here with you, mommy. He gave us a little or orangery, a little glass hut where he had his tropical plants. And he advised me not to run further, to stay there, because people run away further. As it happens, it was a blessing and a curse in the same time because the forest was nearby, the Polish artillery hide in the forest and the Germans have been bombarding the forest. I remember this beautiful autumn day, the sun shining, the bombs like bottles flying in the air and everybody running away to hide. And it was a flower bed up there nearby. And my mommy said, Marisha, let us go and hide it in the flower bed. Whatever will be, we will die between flowers. And with us, hide a few other people. And everybody started to pray. And my mommy asked me, Marishu, pray. And then it came, brought up in a completely not religious house. I never learned to pray. I said, mommy, I don't know what to pray, how to pray. Pray in your own words that God should save us. And as it happens, the whole forest after this bombardment looked like matches without any green branches left. After a day or two, we went back home and my father somehow managed 
to come back from Saulj. And from there you went to Lodge? And then uh, was the day when the Mosseur came throwing us out coming back the meeting next to the town hall and the the last leaving Zgesh perhaps I will say six weeks after the war broke out and did you have any idea of what, what could possibly be ahead? Not at all. No idea at all. Only we knew that we lost everything. My parents lost their life, their lifehood. But I was too young, perhaps to take seriously the position what we have been in. I was in love and I was trying to get near my boyfriend. Where was he when this was going on? In Lodge, what I described to you, that I was asking to go to Lodge. Where we finished at the end, the 1st of May, 1940. And there, from 1st of May, 40, 1940, till August, 1944, I have been enclosed in ghetto lodge with my mother. Did you have to wear a star or how yes. did, when did that happen? When did they um, bring that in? I I am not having a clear memory of it. When? If it still happened in Zgesh or in Lent Lent where we went to or when we came but I am more than positive that in Lodge Ghetto we already had our arm, uh, the yellow star. A beginning armbands and then the yellow star. Did you sew it on yourselves or did they? What my happened? mother, my loving mother. She tried to easier my wife, my life. At the end, we finished that we have been living in one little room, no bigger than my bad, bad room now. And coming from hard work, because I was walking every day about three, four miles for and back to work. On the bed was laying a little collar or a little handkerchief, what she made from rags, showing her love for me. Was the factory where you worked outside the ghetto? No, it was on the border of the ghetto. I was working Marishiska 101 in a shoe making factory, uh, run like a military camp by Bornstein, I think was his name. It was well organized, very clean. When he came into the hall, we all stood up to him, I remember. But it was already, I after I work in a straw factory, then they took me over to this 
shoe, top of the shoes making factor. Was it hard work? For me it was very hard work. I suffered and I must admit I suffered because I couldn't speak Yiddish and the, uh, uh, the foreman was really punishing me because I wasn't speaking Yiddish and on top of it I wasn't able to sew properly because to sew a leather top of a boot you must they have been two rows and I never could make these two rows going parallel to each other and he was standing over me and always screaming and I was crying as it happens, one day he was screaming over me and suddenly I saw on the machine, and I was crying, on the machine his teeth fall out because by then we all have been suffering from hunger and most probably he couldn't hold his teeth back and he was screaming at me and he grabbed the teeth and he ran away and he never came back to me again. So what, what, you'd moved out of your own little hut into this shared place. Who were you living with when you moved? We have been living with my mummy's girlfriend in this one, sharing this room with her and her two children. They were friends before you went into the ghetto. They knew each other. No, my mommy meet, met her sister but at work. As it happens, they have been the daughters of a very well-known lodge rabbi, Alter. Their repu reputation was excellent. But what happened? When I was working daytime, my mother night time, my mother left nearly everything to me and I was leaving everything to my mother. What were you eating? Like what? We had a re ration. And in no time, what we brought from our field, the few potatoes and cabbage disappeared and the food what I was leaving to my mother and she was leaving to me disappeared too. They have been robbing us of our life. It finished that one day I couldn't stand up anymore from bed. And I remember the broken window with a little piece of a um, margarine box written margarine and I was like in a lethargy reading margarine a lemon graft back and forward and I was really dying from hunger. Then came my mother's sister. Where had she been? In a ghetto too. But <coughs> she was privileged. Her husband had fields. They had everything what you can have in luxury in ghetto. How come? Because having fields of garlic and onions, he was selling a garlic for a diamond. The population in desperation, have been selling whatever they had. 
we arrive together nearly penniless and without nothing. But many people came together from, from the town. They still had some provision. Then the German Jews came, the Dutch Jews came, and they had still some jewels, and they even selling it. For a, a garlic, it was a medication. A, a leaf of beetroot was something to eat. He hoard bags of diamonds and other jewels. He was, I must say, a very mean man, person. But at the end, I decided to help to save, to be the witness how did he behave towards my, money, my mommy in times of need. I couldn't save him and his wife and have his and his one small daughter, but I save only one daughter, Renia. Can we go back to when you said you were very sick in bed and you had no food? How how did you get back on your feet? And my auntie came and she saw in what conditions we are. And then they have been bringing again people from outside town, townships from overseas, and she had an apartment. And she worried that they will give her somebody what she doesn't know at all. And she decided to give us this little kitchen attached to her other big room, and we moved with my mommy. I hardly could walk in this little kitchen, having only one brick, you know brick, it's a, a mixture of coal and dust, and a piece of beetroot. But we have been, we got rid of this bloodthirsty family, what was eating us up. As it happens, I found out later, all three died. And can you tell me, was your father, where was your father at this time? My father. He was left in this little hut on the outskirts of ghetto. By then, he was already very weak too. But the situation was very helpless, full of life before. He suddenly started to steal the whatever who could eat. And yet when he lost us, he had only his la ration. And he died one day before they got the ration of bread of bread, because once a week they gave us a round bread. And this should be enough for the whole seven days. He died one day before we received the bread, but most probably he ate it in first or second day when he received it. Then, when he died, My conscience has been terrible. 
because I was my mother's daughter. I went back to this empty shell of a heart. And I spent the whole night with the body of my father's. Waiting in the morning, taking a wheelbarrow together with my mother. <coughs> taking me to the cemetery. When we arrive to the cemetery, they have been on both sides. bodies of dead people, like dolls shining in the cold weather. Only my father was covered with a white sheet. It was the only rem remnants what we had from our home. We gave a piece of bread to one of the grave diggers who showed us to a hall where together we put the body of my father and we tried somehow to cover it with stones. Standing over his grave, I felt jealous because by then it was the winter 1941. I started to think how lucky he is that we are burying him. Who will bury me? Right. And we have been staying with my auntie from about 90, the end of 1941, 1942 to the end of the ghetto. And you were still working, you got you got over your illness or did you get better? Yes, not, been, don't, not being robbed. And having this aberration, somehow we survived, but it was a tragedy. At the weekend, so-called weekend, the day we, 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 when we had been free from uh, working, my mother took out from somewhere few pieces of dry bread, what I div have been dividing in the morning for her and for me, asking her, take whatever you like. Even the, this plate of water in a piece of potato, take which one you like. When I only turn a little bit, she put this potato for me. This cream of bread what she saved. And I was so desperate that I was banging my head on the roof. To get her to eat. And she was saving everything. Did she, was her health all right at this time? They have been. The Germans didn't know how to hurt us. And they made some uh, anti-plane uh, 
uh, exercises. And she took part in them. My mother in the ghetto, she was only 42 or 43, no old. She got uh, pneumonia. And they took her to hospital. The ghetto hospital? Ghetto hospital. What was that like? Yeah. You must understand that to ghetto came such and such amount of food. But Raul Runkowski, it was a clique of privileged people. What robbed the majority of the other ones of food. Now I have few friends, what they sp spent together with me in what ghetto. I didn't know them there. But each one of them, of my friends today, had a privileged position in ghetto. Getting uh, 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 Bayrat, it was a, Bayrat was a special parcel every week or every month. Or a friend, uh, Helix Schlatkowski, he was a courier who was carrying the parcels to the privileged people. On the way, he was stealing a little bit, and it helped him a lot. Did you receive any of these privileges? Not at all. Even Only though you're once. After the Spera in 1943, the which? In 1943 was a Spera. I think in autumn 1943. Then they have been block, uh, block by block, have been uh, soldiers and Jewish police. taking everybody down in a yard of a house, selecting el this ones who didn't look well, nearly well, or children, and they sent them away. In the house what we have been living, they sent nearly everybody away to that. We found out lately, we didn't know where they are. They told them that they are going to evacuate them to a easier work, mm -hmm. to kindergartens, but they have been taken straight away by guest buses to the dead. Okay. 